We are obsessed, curious, distracted, and fixated. Like an accident on the side of the road, we can't look away. Something or someone has our attention. We are followers, and we are all following something. Sports teams, political candidates, natural disasters, breaking news, financial markets, technology trends, famous people. The list never ends. What is your curious obsession? Who or what are you following? Is Jesus on your list? Does he turn in and out of your thoughts? Is he a consideration of who you are and what you do? He should be. Let your heart catch fire with what it means to be a Jesus father. Your life will never be the same. Good morning. So I was, a couple things I was reminded as I was coming in here this morning. One is that I've already got more people than we had last week, and so we should feel good about that, but... But I also was reminded that you were in and out in 45 minutes last week. Um, and I'm not sure which direction I should take that. But my response was that that should give me another 15 minutes for today if we need them. But we're glad that you are here. If you are watching online, we're glad that you have taken this time to be with us this Sunday morning as well. We're glad that you have decided to worship with us, the Lord and Savior. We invite you to use the comment section if you are online to let us know that you're online. Push that uh, like button. Push it out to as many people as we can. And then when we come to the time of our prayer concerns, uh, we certainly want to lift up your concerns as well uh, when we lift ours up so that if you'd use that comment section, let us know what prayer concerns you may have. We would like to share those with us. You all have got those prayer concerns. You should get the email from Lynn that gives the uh, schedule and um, the uh, prayers of people that we uh, listed in the bulletin, uh, we'll lift them up. Um, we're going to add to that concern when we come to that time of uh, Janice. The reason the praise team is not singing, Janice came down with COVID during the week. Um, she's doing well. In fact, it's supposed to be back in school uh, tomorrow, but we'll continue to lift her up in our prayers. The thing that I'm really excited about uh, on this week, Tuesday, this Tuesday, we'll start confirmation class. Uh, starting at 5 o'clock uh, and going till uh, 6. Right now, we'll look at you know, 6, 6.30, but we're going to say 6 o'clock for this first one and see how things go. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. We have at least three of our young uh, youth that uh, are going to be taking that class with the idea of them coming into membership on Easter Sunday. Uh, so you may get involved here down the road because we will be looking down in the, in the next couple of weeks uh, as we establish what the uh, what that class is going to look like and what are those subject matters we're going to handle, mentoring will be one of those things. Um, and we will leave that up to the young people to choose a mentor. So if you get a call, uh, if you get a request, uh, I would ask that you prayerfully consider of uh, accepting that to be that mentor to that young person as they get ready to join the church this year. Those are the prayer concerns and announcements I want to lift up at this time. I think we have an opening prayer. I invite you to unite our voices together. Oh God, in the midst of the cacophony of voices that crush our spirit and deny our calling, voices that say, who do you think you are? We come to hear your voice of affirmation. We come to hear your voice calling us to be and do what you have called us to be and do. Let this time of worship quiet our fears, soothe our bruised souls, and energize us for ministry in and with your beloved world. Let faith abide, let hope abide here in this sanctuary, here in our community, here in our world, but most of all, here in us. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts and minds then as we go into a time of worship as we listen to our prelude.
I'd invite you to remain in your pew sitting uh, as we sing our opening hymn, Lord of the Dance. <laughs> going to our time of prayer concerns, I invite you again to the prayer blankets that are on the rail for Don and Sheila. I invite you to come up anytime during the worship service or after worship and lay your hands on them. Uh, the news that we have uh, is that uh, their uh, recuperation, their recovery is going well, uh, and in fact, perhaps they may be home by the, by the middle of February, towards the end of February. Uh, that is uh, speculation right now, and um, as we find out additional news, though, that we'll keep you informed. Um, and then when, when that time comes, we will be looking for some, some help from you to, to help take care of them during, to meet some of their needs. But we'll deal with that when we finally get word that they're coming home. For our concerns, as one of the advantages we have when we're online is we get those prayer concerns from, from other people who are watching. Uh, request for a Fred Witten. Fred was... Uh, one of my right-hand mans and the trustees when I was at, uh, at uh, Hyde Park in Hammond, um, Fred is, uh, is a wonderful person and found out he's got a tumor on his lung. Uh, and then Melinda Hinton is also a member of Hyde Park, uh, and she's asking prayers for her, her family, grandkids, 
Um, so if you add those two individuals to your prayer concerns, as well as the list that you have from Lynn. Let's sing our prayer hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. We'll sing that through one time, then go into a moment of silence, allowing you to take these prayer concerns, or simply for you to listen for God to speak to you. Uh, and then I'll close with prayer. It is well. Most holy God, we thank you that through your great love you have accepted us, that you have called us your own, that you have made us family with you and with one another. We are so blessed to know what it means to be adopted, to be adopted into your family, to receive love beyond our deserving. And so, God, we ask that you would forgive us when we are tempted to put limits on your grace, on your grace toward us, and your grace toward others. Forgive us when we are tempted to have people or even groups of people who we wish you wouldn't love quite so much. Remind us, oh God, that each of us have a dark place in our heart, a place that categorizes people. Remind us that we are all tempted to think of those who are inside our circle and those who are outside our circle, that we are more likely to care for the concerns of those we think who are like us than we are about those who are on the outside of our circle. We are more likely to care for those who are on our side than those who are on the other side. But you, O oh God, you have shown us repeatedly that there are no outsiders in your kingdom. You kiss the leper clean in every time and in every place the lepers have taken different forms. Sinners of various kinds, people of different social class, enemies near and far. The fact is you keep on making us uncomfortable by loving the wrong people. And you make us even more uncomfortable by calling us to love them too. So God, stretch us. Make us uncomfortable. Teach us to love beyond our loving. Teach us to make your love true, to put hands and feet to your love for the outsider. Today, today, teach us. Today, we do as you taught us. Today, we begin to love the unlovable. Today, we pray for our enemies. Today, we rejoice because it is in loving the outsider that we were brought in from the cold. It's because someone prayed for your enemies that you destroyed the enmity we once had with you. Today, O oh Lord, we begin this new chapter. 
loving one another as you have loved us. So God, we gather here in this holy place, bring up these prayer concerns. You've heard those listed already. We lift up to you, Don and Sheila, and we pray that your healing continues to take place in them. We give you thanks for the healing that has been there, that has taken place. We know that it's still a long road ahead. But we are thankful. We are thankful for that healing. We're thankful for that time that they will be returned here into this community. That we can reach out with our hands and feet to be your hands and feet to them. We lift up to you Janice who's recovering from COVID. We pray that you continue to pour out your healing spirit on her. And as she returns to her classroom, she teaches those young people that she teaches, that you would give her strength to do her job. We lift up to you, Fred, who such a disciple of yours as he discovered this lung. And God, we're not sure what that means. We put our faith and trust in you. Be with the doctors and the nurses that will be treating Fred that prescribed the right medication or the right procedure, whatever it needs to be done to heal him as only you can heal him. We lift up to you, Melinda, the prayer concerns that she has. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon her and her family. Lord God, we know that there are those here in this sanctuary that, that have health concerns, that have Stresses beyond imagination. God, we just lift these up to you. We give them to you. We ask that your healing hand would reach out and touch those individuals. Lord God, we know that in the midst of all of this, we are still a divided nation in so many ways. So we ask for your healing spirit to surround all of us. Remind us that we are all your children. So we pray for one another. Regardless of political parties, regardless of who's in power, God, we pray for our leaders. Pray on the decisions they make that they would benefit all of us. We pray for the tensions in the world, Russia, NATO, Ukraine, Pray for, for your intervention, that cool heads would prevail. That there would be a solution that would be acceptable to all parties. We pray for our young men and women in the armed forces. Pray that you would do your best to keep them from harm's way. We pray for their families. Lord God, we continue to pray for our health professionals as, as COVID continues to the surge dies down in some places, comes up again in new places. The stress that it puts on our, our medical professionals, uh, we just pray that you would surround them as only you can. Continue to give them the strength to do their job, to, to look after those that become sick. We pray that you would guide us to do our parts in all those different ways of trying to keep each other safe. Most of all, God, we pray that you would surround all of us with your Holy Spirit. Guide us in the decisions we make every single day to be your hands and feet, to reach out into this community to reach out into our sphere of influence, wherever that may lead us. That those that we come in contact with would see the love that we have for you, the love that we have for each other, that it would be contagious, that it would lead to peace to all people. For we pray all this in the name of your Son, our Lord, and our Savior, who taught us to pray with these words, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever Again, we want to continue to thank you for your faithfulness to this church, to God's kingdom, by returning your tithes and your offering. I think we have a, an offering prayer. I invite you to join us in unison as we give our thanks. Gracious and loving God, receive our gifts of self and substance. They have belonged to you since our very beginning. We give them freely, joyfully, prayerfully. With them we praise you. With them we celebrate the great power that is love, a love that abides always, a love that radically transforms, a love that makes us whole. Amen. Your reading this morning is Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zephyrath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Barb. Yeah, I've told you uh, many times, I think, that when we are reading scripture, it is always important to understand not only what we're reading, but what has transpired right before the, the, the reading that we are on. And so when we look back at this fourth chapter of Luke, it's understanding that today's reading is really a continuation of, of what we read last week. Luke begins to tell us that in this fourth chapter, remember that, that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And then he was sent out into the desert. And, and you know the story. Jesus was sent out there and lasted, he was out there for, what, 40 days, tempted by the devil, offering all this, this power and, and wealth and prestige. You know, and, and, and for everything that the devil would offer Jesus, Jesus had a response about why he had to remain faithful to God. Uh, and then we said, you know, that, that Jesus passed all those tests faithfully, and, and the devil then, we're told, leaves him and for a more opportune time. 
And then the fourth chapter continues then to tell us that this is really the beginning of Jesus' ministry, that he, he goes out among the villages of Galilee and begins to preach in their synagogues, begins to talk about the message that he is spreading throughout the land. So, so that when he comes into Nazareth, this is not the first time that he has given his message. Now, so his, his reputation somewhat precedes him. That the people are well aware of who he is and, and what his message has been. And so they're looking forward to what Jesus has to say. And in fact, when, when we pick up this piece from Scripture, it's, it's, very, you know, it's a continuation of last week. We're told that Jesus picked up the scrolls, he, he reads from Isaiah, and then he lays the scrolls down, and he says, today this reading has been fulfilled in your hearing. And we're told that all of the people thought wonders of him, thought, you know, this is good, this is good stuff. You know, Jesus is a great teacher. And so they're excited that he's there among him. And, and, and so remember where we ended last week. He said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And then he sits down. And remember, when a rabbi sits down, that is really the beginning of his teaching. And he continues to teach for them. Now, we know that what Jesus read from was, was either... What a combination of the 58th chapter of Isaiah and the 61st chapter of Isaiah. And we know what he said. He said, you know, words about this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. That this is the year of the Lord's jubilee to let the oppressed go free. And those are words that the people wanted to hear. Those are words that they expected to hear. Those were words that excited them because they thought that he was talking to them about them. When he's talking about the poor, they thought they would, this is good news. He's talking about us. When he's talking about release, they thought he was talking about them. And, and why shouldn't have they have heard it that way? When, when he's talking about the poor, they could have been thinking about the heavy taxation from the Roman occupancy. When, he, when he's talking about release of, of the captives, maybe he's talking about getting rid of this, the Roman occupying army. These were good words that they wanted to hear. These were words that they very much believed, applied to them. And we're told that at the end of last week's reading that, that they were all amazed and that and they were all happy. They were they just they loved what they were hearing. And, and if Jesus had just stopped right there, we wouldn't have the rest of this chapter. But Jesus continues and, and that's where the trouble began because Jesus began to tell everybody that, that God's grace goes beyond you, that God's grace is offered for everybody. And then he, and he, and he tells two stories. Two stories. The first one is a story that, that you all should remember. People you know, understand that, that the stories he's telling the people are stories that they would have memorized in and, and their upbringing. They would have known these stories. Tell us first about the story of Elijah. You remember that story in, in, in 1 Kings, the 17th chapter. Elijah goes to, to Zarephath uh, in a you know, Phoenician city. He goes to a widow there. Remember, there had been a drought for three and a half years. And Elijah goes to this widow. And here this widow is, we're told, is, is picking up sticks to start a, a small fire because she has just a little bit of flour left and just a little bit of oil left, and she's going to make her, her last meal for her and her son, and, and then she's going to die because she just doesn't have the strength, the nourishment, the food, the oil to continue on. And the drought has taken its toll, and, 
and she's got just this little bit of ingredients left, and, and then it's all over. And Elijah says, you know what? Go ahead and make the, make the, you know, start the fire and make the meal. Use that last bit of oil and that, and that last bit of flour. Use it all because make a little bit of extra for me. And have faith. Because I promise you that the flour in the jar and the oil in the jar will never run out until the drought is over. We're told the widow does what, what Elijah asked. And, and you know the story that the oil never runs out, the flour never runs out. It's a story that the people would have known. And then he talks about Elijah. Elisha, and he talks about Naaman, who suffered from leprosy. And he, how, how Naaman's wife's servant convinces Naaman to, about Elijah and, and, and the healing of, of the Jordan River, and, and, and Naaman takes a bath in the Jordan River. people would have known those stories. They were expecting something else. Do for us what you have done for others. Part of that story that, that, that Barb read. Do for us. Give us what you have given others. Heal us like you have healed others. Don't tell us something we already know but give us what we want. And when he didn't, we're told that the people were filled with rage because Jesus didn't tell them anything new. Jesus didn't tell them something new. In their heads, they knew the story. And they were angry. Give us what you have given other people. And he didn't, and they were mad. And anger. Anger can be a funny thing, can it? When we talk about anger with words like controlling our temper, when the reality is oftentimes our tempers control us, right? I mean, there's... There's a fury that, that builds up inside. Before we know it, we've done something or we've said something that has been hurtful, that has caused great harm. We do things in anger that we would never do otherwise. We do things in anger that we would never think of doing. under the influence of rage and angry. You really think this, this congregation, these, these people gathered in the temple, you really think they were people who were willing to commit murder in the synagogue? And we were told that that's exactly what they wanted to do. They were filled with rage. Because in a crowd, in a crowd, anger seems to take over. And all of our inhibitions fly out the window. What the unthinkable, the undoable becomes a reality. Anger be a dangerous thing. You take a look at the at the Tulsa massacre in 1921. And you can read about it. It you know it started off with supposedly a comment made, an accusation of disrespect. And then there was a riot. And depending on which information you're reading, which book you're getting, it can be anywhere up to over 300 people killed. And the numbers vary, but a lot of historians will say up to, an, 
including 300 people, were massacred that day simply because of anger. A realistic understanding of what evil can happen when we let our our temper control us. And we know, we know that that over time that our capacity for brutal behavior hasn't changed. There's a story of of, uh, Peter Story as a Methodist bishop who was with Desmond Tutu in South Africa during the time of apartheid. Both of them known for their courage, their prophetic zeal. Both of them known how to speak up for what's right and what's wrong. They come together in this one particular visit, facing a hostile crowd, ultimately was chased out of the city, banished, if you will. They actually decided to, that it was in their best interest to leave while the leaving was, while they were able to, and, and it was only afterwards that, that they both decided that, that they were lucky that they had not been killed. And then they hear the story that, in fact, an army general had ordered them executed. But for some reason, that order was never carried out. And in fact, that army officer who, who had ordered that execution had, at, at later time had sought both of them out and and sought their forgiveness. How do we react in anger? We know the outcome of Bishop Story and Archbishop Tutu. We don't know the story. What happened to the crowd? after they had chased Jesus out of the temple. Luke doesn't tell us. Luke doesn't give us an ending. We know in, in, in Bishop Story and, and, and Archbishop Tudor that the planned killing was, was averted. We're told that that the crowd, while the crowd wanted to kill Jesus, he, Luke tells us he simply walked through the, the crowd and, and, and just disappeared. He doesn't tell us what happened to the crowd. What happens to that mob in Nazareth? Let your imagination run for a little bit. What might have happened to them? Luke tells us that Jesus walked through them and escaped danger. Did they did they feel remorse for what they had come close to doing? Did, did they did they feel sorry for the way this whole thing had started to develop? Did they, they did they feel any type of shame? Did they were they doing some soul searching on what had just transpired? How how could they turn in to this evil crowd willing to commit murder in the synagogue? Did they do some soul searching to, to try to find an answer of, of why they acted the way they did? Luke doesn't tell us. Now, maybe they blame Jesus for the whole thing. After all, it, it, his sermon that created the problem. Maybe they simply blame Jesus for their actions. And, and they, they failed to find this opportunity for a spiritual blessing. Maybe they just shrugged their shoulders and shook it off. What ending do you put on 
to that crowd. How might have they acted differently? Luke doesn't tell us. In fact, there are several stories in the Gospel of Luke where he leaves it open-ended, leaving it up to you to try to, to put an ending, uh, put a, a closure on this story. The prodigal son. Remember the story of the prodigal son who leaves and, and spends all of his fortune and then you know, eventually makes his way back to the father and the father is so happy he throws this lavish party and the older son is so mad angry at his father for, for welcoming this younger son back who has wasted everything. And you remember the story of the father says, son, you need to come back inside. The son of mine who was lost has now been found. He invites the older son to join the party. We don't know if he ever did. Luke doesn't tell us. Luke leaves it up to you to determine what did the older son do. Well, the story of Martha and Mary. You know, Martha is so upset about Mary. Who's, you know, Martha's in the kitchen doing all the chores and getting all the preparation done, and, and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus, and, and Martha is so upset. And Jesus tells her that Mary's doing the thing that matters the most. Did Martha change her attitude? Did, did Martha learn anything from what Jesus said about Mary? We don't know. Luke leaves it up to you to, to try to answer. Luke leaves it up to you to, to form an answer that fits for you. How do we react when we find ourselves in situations that we don't normally agree with. Jesus says, I came to give release to the captives. What captives you? What impoverishes you? What poverty are you facing? Because Jesus offers a way, a release from that poverty that crushes our soul. Jesus offers us a way out of those things that hold us down. Whatever those things are for you. Whatever is holding you back. A feeling. Grace that God's offer, not only to you, but the person sitting next to you or behind you. God offers us grace, offers us encouragement, offers us strength to overcome our rage, to overcome the anger. If we let our spirits guide us. If we let that Holy Spirit that resides inside us, if we let that voice of reasoning direct who we are and whose we are, God offers that way of overcoming the anger and the rage. And if we use that properly, that if we use that to escape, then and we use it to increase knowledge that if we learn from it to become a stronger, a better person to have that knowledge and understanding of this story in Isaiah that God's grace is offered to every single person no matter who they are no matter what they've done when we accept that, when we fully understand that, then maybe, just maybe, we learn to control our anger and our rage. 
so that we don't lash out at those who are different from us. Today, we have such a division in this country between the political parties, between black and white. We have, we have a division that is so great in so many areas. If we can change that, we can change that. And it starts right here today with you and me. And accepting what Jesus tells us in this gospel reading. God's grace is offered to everyone. And when we accept that, we can become those peacemakers that offers God's grace to everyone. We can become those people who can provide healing. We become those people who can extend God's love to our neighbors, to those who, who might think a little bit differently from us, who might be on the opposite political side of us, who might be someone who we don't care very much for. But when we understand God's grace is open to everyone. That we are called today to be those people to extend God's grace. Then we become those people who control our rage, control our anger, so that God can work within us and among us to bring us together as one people. name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. Join us in our closing hymn. Here I am, Lord. <laughs>
will you go? Jesus said, today, this reading has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, you are people who are called to be people of God, to go out into the world caring for one another, sharing God's love, letting everyone know that God's grace is offered to all. Go from this place and share the good news. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you and be the people God has called you to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen.